You are listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast, where we look to educate and entertain the endurance racing community through discussions with racing professionals and elite age groupers. Today, I speak with professional triathlete Doug McLean. We talk about his rowing background, how he got to become a professional triathlete, and talk about his coaching philosophy. We also discuss the mental side of endurance racing and how to build strength and confidence mentally and dealing with the pain and suffering of endurance sports. I hope you enjoy this episode. So, Doug, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good. I I can't complain. I'm in my off-season break. I just did uh, Ironman Arizona, was it Uh, 9, 10, 11, whatever, Uh, 10, 11 days ago, and so I haven't done anything even resembling exercise since then so uh starting to feel pretty rested and recharged right now it's pretty nice yeah i know how that feels after a race you get a little bit of downtime and i definitely want to get into that race in a little bit because uh i heard it was a pr for you so congratulations on that yeah thanks thanks it was uh although caveats do apply i mean arizona is generally a pretty fast course and we had I'm not going to say the bike conditions were great because it was pretty windy out on the B line, probably probably windier than usual. But I mean, you want to talk about ideal running conditions? Yeah, I mean, you couldn't you couldn't ask for anything better. It was low to mid 70s and overcast. That that's as good as it gets uh, when you're running the marathon at, at two in the afternoon. You know, uh, like so. I mean, it was a, a overall PR. Like you can't necessarily compare that to say, your time from a, a course like Lake Placid or Lake Tahoe, because, you know, obviously it's going to be faster than your, your times on those courses, just because it's a faster course. But it was like a 10-minute PR for me on the Arizona course also. So, you know, I, I do think it was probably uh, one of my better performances. Maybe not my best performance, but, you know, certainly something I can feel good about. So why don't we start off with uh, talking a little bit about your athletic background and how you got into triathlons and and what was your kind of athletic experience in college and 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 so forth that led to becoming a professional triathlete? Uh, Yeah. So starting out growing up, I I did fairly, you know, quote unquote, traditional sports, and they were certainly focused on fun rather than suffering. Uh, Like in high school, I played baseball, basketball, and volleyball. And then I got to college. And so my friend wanted to go to the rowing tryouts just because some girl he liked was trying out for the women's rowing team. (laughs) And I was like, and he just wanted me to go just so he could have someone there with him. And I was like, (laughs) okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's like, fine, whatever. So I went down and I put my name on a list, but I didn't think I'd really have time for it. So I just went to like, an informational meeting or something and never went back. And that was that. Uh, and then about a month later, I got an email from the rowing coach and he was like, Doug, what happened to you? He kind of disappeared after an informational meeting, which was really weird to me because it's not like he would have any idea who I was. Maybe he just saw like my height and weight or something and was like, Oh, maybe I'll email this guy. So that was one factor pushing me into it. And also my uncle actually um, was an Olympic silver medalist in rowing in 76 in Montreal. Oh, wow. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was another factor. So between the coaching and emailing me and kind of the family history and rowing, those two things kind of pushed me back into like, okay, maybe I'll give rowing a shot. Um, And I went down to the boathouse and kind of the, the rest is history. It just went from there. You know, one thing turned into another and I really kind of latched onto it. And I ended up rowing all four years. And I set a really weird uh, world record in the process. Like sophomore year, just before Thanksgiving, there's this thing on on, uh, rowing machines where they only count up to 99,999 yards uh, or meters, I guess. Sorry. And uh, we were just sitting around the dining hall one day. And we were like, what happens when you go past 99,999? And of course, I applied one of my favorite life sayings, which is, well, there's only one way to find out. <laughs> and so it was decided that we would uh, attempt to row 100 kilometers, you know, just to see what happens when you get past 99.999 kilometers. 
And uh, so I did that sophomore year, and I had a couple people with me. Um, and as it turns out, it just flips back to zero. Um, oh, that's for, disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, right? You, you want, like, fireworks or something, right? Um, and then I was like, oh, that was fun. So I did it again junior and, and senior year. And I didn't know it. I didn't find out um, until after the fact. But I had set a, a lightweight world record while doing that. So that was kind of fun. Um, it was six hours and 54 minutes. So I, I was a world record holder on the rowing machine for a few years. I mean, it's a very obscure world record, but I can kind of put that on the resume as a bullet point. Uh, and then some, some British guy broke it by like two minutes or something. And I was like, really, bro? Two minutes <laughs> over seven hours? Like, give me a break. And then uh, senior year, I ended up winning, uh, like, most of the regular season, we race in eights. But then you go to nationals, and we there's eights, there's fours, there's pairs. Like, we break up into uh, different size boats. And uh, I ended up winning a national title in the pair. So that was pretty cool. That, that was kind of a nice way to cap off the career. And that was that. And then I graduated, and I had to go off to the Navy because I had done ROTC. Um, I mean, got to pay for college somehow, right? So I did ROTC. My time in the Navy, along with, with knee troubles while I was in the Navy, but basically a four-year black hole in my athletic career. Um, like, you know, I put on 15 pounds and pretty sedentary. That was that. And then I got out of the Navy and I was just hanging out with my buddy Dan. And we were down at, uh, you know, the, the big music festival, Bonnaroo, down in Tennessee. And there were a group of us down there. And one of our friends, Dan, had done uh, Lake Placid in, I want to say, 04? 04, 04, 04 or 05. And he ended up getting a roll down slot to Kona. And so we were talking about that. I didn't know what Ironman was. I didn't know what triathlon was. Um, I knew it was something really long, but that's about it. And, you know, I needed a new athletic outlet. So I was like, oh, well, Dan did it. Um, and I think I'm just as good of an athlete as he is. So I guess I could do it. So a whole bunch of us then signed up for Placid 07. And I actually also signed up for Coeur d'Alene 07. So Coeur d'Alene was maybe my fifth or sixth triathlon ever. And Placid was just the next one. And it was four weeks later. And I was like, wow, that sucked. But I, I knew I could go a lot faster. I went, so Coeur d'Alene that year, I went 1059. And then Placid 07, I went 1046. But I kind of... I knew I was leaving a lot on the table and it just kind of stewed in the back of my brain. So I, I was in a PhD program at Michigan and I was, I kind of just, I, I, I realized I just wasn't that interested in being a professor. And so December of 08, I just kind of, I call it like my consolation masters. Um, I just kind of took my consolation masters and moved out to, to Colorado question did you find the uh the rowing uh as a good transfer over to triathlon i know there was a gap of time between the two but did it set like a endurance base or cardio base for you or made the swimming a little easier because i know there's similar muscle groups there i'm just curious if the rowing machine is something people can try to mix in for training once in a while for cross training so i can i could talk about that like oh god we're gonna need three hours here <laughs> <laughs> Um, absolutely. I, I think rowing tends to have a better crossover with cycling. Um, because when you get down to it, rowing is probably 50, 60% of the power generation is, uh, from your, from your kind of quads and glutes, right. which are directly involved in, in cycling. And it's a very, in terms of the direction of motion and power application, it's a very similar leg extension type of motion to cycling. I think, it, I mean, certainly there is some crossover to swimming, but I think the most direct kind of like neuromuscular crossover is the cycling. Um, I think the real benefit of rowing, though, is that it's really, 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 really painful. Um, and it teaches you how to suffer, which I would say is probably the most valuable skill in triathlon is in knowing how to override your body's pain signals and not letting them force you to back off the throttle. Um, I mean, there's still nothing in my life that I've done 
that's as painful as a 3K test on a rowing machine. Um, Like, we raced 2K, but just because our coach was sadistic, he would have us test 3K on the rowing machine. And that's just the 10 most awful minutes you could ever imagine. Right. So in in terms of building that ability to suffer and that mental strength, is it just, uh, in your opinion, really doing hard sets and tests and just uh, getting used to it and getting comfortable with that knowing your body's not going to break down? Or do you have any other tips or tricks that you use to kind of build that up? Because that's probably one of the biggest things people um, you know have to combat in endurance sports, and it's hard to develop. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that's kind of a, a funny thing. Like, you can go in knowing and, and telling yourself, like, when I feel pain, that doesn't mean I'm going to die. It's just my body being irrational and thinking that I'm going to die. Um, but you have to, you know, and I, and I can tell myself that I'm going to consciously override it. But that's the thing. Like, it's easy to sit there on a couch or, or in a discussion and say that and tell yourself that you're going to do it. But it's a completely different thing to do it when literally every single part of your body is screaming. And all you have to do to get it to not scream is just back off 5%. Right. It is you know, that, that's really hard to do to not back off that 5%. Um, and so while there is value in, in thinking about it and, and planning for it, like the only way I, I think to really develop it and really learn it is to just beat into your subconscious mind that you can handle this level of pain and you're not going to die. And you're going to do that by, you know, in rowing, you're going to do that by sitting down on the erg and just doing, you know, like seven by 700 meters all out, you know, stuff like that. And, you know, that easily translates into, you know, track work, going to the track and doing 20 by 400 all out or, you know, whatever, going to a bike race, like doing cyclocross racing or whatever, anything where you're just going absolutely maximal and just conditioning kind of your, your subconscious to not be completely freaked out by, by pushing your body that hard. Yeah. Right. So for someone who has, I guess, less experience, so let's say a beginner or intermediate uh, triathlete or any endurance sport, I mean, how do you balance that with the possibility of injury or, or going too much? Obviously, at the professional level, you sort of know where your limits are physically and, and really the mental barrier is your your main uh, thing you're, you're competing with. But uh, for someone less experienced, what would you recommend there? Like, how do they know? Or am I, is, is the pain real? Should I push through it? How, how, do, how do you balance that? Right. And, and that's, I mean, that, that's a tricky thing because I don't want to be on record saying you can push as hard as you want and you're never going to die because like, that's a stupid thing to say, you know, like, because you can put yourself into very dangerous situations you know, related to overheating, dehydration, that type of stuff. Um, And so that's what you really have to do is you have to become very experienced at learning to sort out what's okay pain versus what's not okay pain. And that's a very individual thing. And that's not something I think I can necessarily describe very quickly and easily. But a lot of it has to do with like looking at your kind of – power output or pace at a given heart rate, you know, that can tell you a lot about the the, uh, state of heat stress that your body is experiencing or the state of dehydration that your body is experiencing. You know, a lot of it is just feeling and and just learning to separate between the two types of pain by putting yourself into those kind of rough situations and training. And you're always just kind of testing the water and just like going an inch deeper each time and just finding out those limits and and finding out what the okay limit feels like versus what the not okay limit feels like. So, yeah, I I think a lot of it is just personal experience. And a lot of it on top of that is just not being afraid to fail. Like in, in points in training, going to the points where you do physically fail and not letting that force you to back off next time. Instead of viewing it as a negative, you just view it as a learning experience and say, okay, that was my failure point. Now I know what that feels like, and I know I came through and I'm on the other side, and it's okay, and maybe I'll try to push it half a percent further next time and see what that feels like. And then when you feel those similar things on race day, then you know, oh, okay, this is okay. It's just 
physical exertion. It's not a, a health type of situation. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, that does. So let, let's switch gears for a second. So you're now yeah. uh, based out of Ithaca, New York, which is a place uh, close to my heart. I went to school there, and I actually got married up there. So I absolutely love that town. Um, it's also actually, I, I tricked you. Uh-oh. I didn't trick you. I just moved. I moved very recently. Oh uh, no! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Ithaca, Ithaca is my kind of spiritual home. Um, I have spent more years there than than I can count. Um, no, I, I just moved to uh, Massachusetts. Yeah, That's my kind of- my question is still relevant then, although maybe not as yeah, yeah. relevant. My my question was going to be, Ithaca is probably one of the most beautiful places in the world in the summer and probably, I mean, I know is a great tri- triathlon training ground and has some great races and things. Yeah. But in the winter is one of the harshest places imaginable. So I, I was just curious to get your thoughts or kind of how you approach the winter from a training perspective. I mean, do you do a lot of stuff on the trainer from a bike or um, do you run inside, outside? Um, just those types of things. I'm curious because as we go into winter, winter i know a lot of people struggle with that well okay first of all to defend ithaca so many places in the u.s are terrible for training in the winter that's true <laughs> <laughs> you know um and I, I i have trained everywhere in the u.s and there are other places that i'll admit are probably as good as ithaca but there's nowhere that's better than Ithaca. it is simply phenomenal in the summer like between may and october uh, i will take it i will put it up against anywhere Boulder. Yeah. You know, California, Oregon, anything. It's a good, absolutely great back in the country. Um, so for the winter, um, I mean, swimming obviously stays the same. You know, no big deal. Uh, biking, it's all on the trainer. I, I kind of, you know, I often look for excuses to ride inside just because I'm getting to the point where I'm kind of sick of dealing with cars. Yeah. So... You know, I, yeah, I admit riding on the trainer can be kind of dull, but it's safe and it's very time efficient. So whatever, I'm fine with it. And you get on like, you know, you can watch a movie, you listen to music, or you can get on something like Swift and like, it makes it pretty tolerable. Um, so I don't mind, you know, getting on the trainer. And then as far as running, the only way I'll really get on the treadmill is if it's, in the winter, uh, if there's definitely ice all over the roads or if the sun has gone down. But if it's daylight in the winter and it's nothing worse than snow, like I'll go outside. Like I absolutely love running in the snow. It's super fun. Uh, I like snowshoeing. Um, yeah, it's just a fun time. I'll, I'll, I'll run in anything that's basically above 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you can always just put on more clothes, you know, put on, put on some yak tracks if you think no, it's a little bit too hard packed and it might be slippery. Um, or if you're going in deep snow, you put on, on snowshoes and it's a really good strength workout. Uh, so, you know, whatever. I, I don't mind winter training at all. I think it's fun. And I tend to get in the weight room a lot because I'm not exactly a massive dude. And packing on some muscle is always going to help someone like me uh, on the bike. As, as I think a lot of pros are trending to be a bit more muscular these days so they can really push it a bit more on the bike. And so I kind of want to make sure I don't get too far left behind in, in that department. Right. Besides being a professional triathlete, you also coach people. So from a coaching perspective, how, how do you go about kind of uh, uh, adjusting the plan or, or understanding uh, how to deal with someone who has a 40-hour work week or more and kind of isn't able to dedicate everything to triathlon? I, I just treat them as athletes. I, I don't necessarily think about a pro versus age group distinction. Um, you know, I've been around a lot of pros and, you know, I mean, I am one myself and these age groupers I coach, a lot of them work every bit just as hard and they, they, they want to work every bit just as hard as the pros. So, yeah, I, I mean, I do give leeway, obviously, because I realize they're not trying to m- make a living off of it. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I give leeway, leeway to everybody, like even for, you know, someone who's living purely off prize money, you know, racing is still not a more important than, than their, than their spouse, or it's still not more important than their kid. So like, if they have to do something to take care of a family member, like skip a workout and take care of your family member, whether you're a, a 16 hour Ironman or an 804 Ironman, that kind of a thing. 
the only way I treat age groupers, and it's not even treating them differently because you just treat every athlete this way. You just say, what are your logistical life constraints? How much are you willing, how, how much time per week are you willing to dedicate to training? And then you just do the best you can with that available time, whether it's eight hours, 15 hours, 19 hours, or 28 hours, you know? Yeah. Uh, humans are humans, and they want to get faster, and, and there's ways to do that. It's, it's not like pros have different biochemical systems than age groupers, you know? The, the same types of workouts that work for pros are going to work for age groupers. You just maybe have to scale it back to, to account for their life logistics. You know, one of the things I, I saw on your blog or, or website or whatever was the fact that um, you've been able to coach a number of athletes to go to Kona, which is, for those not familiar, the world championship in, uh, you know, Ironman racing, which is, has all the tradition, is on NBC, all that kind of stuff. Um, what are some of the keys to, to that? I mean, what, you know, how do you take that, take an athlete to the next level to go from being a you know, competitive age grouper to being able to get to that like top realm of one or two or three where the roll down happens and you get to go to and qualify for Kona? I mean, where, what is the difference there? Is it just a matter of time and experience or, or is it, um, are, are there other kind of secrets that you, you would share with us? Uh, well, that's the thing. There are no secrets. Okay, I, I guess I, I stress my athletes with training. I make sure they're sleeping. I make sure they're eating. Um, I make sure they're they're fueling properly and using good gear. I keep them healthy. Like I'm ultra ultra paranoid about injuries. Any any hint of a running injury, and I have them water running and uh, doing some extra biking. You know, because when it gets down to it, my most important job is getting to the starting line healthy. Um, so I always keep that in mind and I make sure I, I, I do my best to kind of instill in, instill a belief in them that they trust their training. Um, I, I think that might be one of the most important things I do because there's no killer on race day or, or in training that, that will eat an athlete alive more than doubting what they're doing and not having confidence in what they're doing. But if you can get an athlete to believe in what they're doing and, and, and fully commit to it, I mean, they can run through brick walls. And that's something I really stress. Uh, some people really buy into it easily. Some people, it can be a bit of a struggle. Um, but we, you know, we get there eventually with everybody. And because once you have an athlete who buys in and, and has that self confidence, you know, it it can do anything, and and it's really fun to see them when it when it finally clicks for them. Um, they they tend to go pretty fast. You know, I almost think I almost think the training, the workouts in and of themselves don't matter that much. You know, like what's the difference between doing three by fifteen minutes tempo versus two by 25 minutes tempo or, you know, whatever, like whatever, they're the same thing, you know, um, it's just a matter of making sure the athlete holding the athlete accountable to that and making sure the athlete knows that that session is making them stronger and faster. And if you do that, I think they're going to be pretty good. So nothing, nothing fancy, like just holding them accountable. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess that confidence piece is so important. And it's funny you mentioned that. I, I on this uh, podcast, I actually recently interviewed a guy who ran across the country in forty-two days. He broke the record in thirty-one hundred miles. And I asked him like, what was the key to it? And he said it was all about confidence. It's all about putting in the work up front and having confidence in it to be able to to accomplish it. And he said once you have that confidence, you can pretty much do anything. And that's exactly what you're saying, right? Is you know, you put in all the yeah. training, have the confidence, and and uh, ultimately it will pay off on race day. Yeah, and that, that actually feeds back to what I was talking about before with um, the whole uh, kind of suffering and pain tolerance type of a thing. You just need to have the confidence to know that you can go another step. And once you have that, you're going to make it. You know, the, the body is capable of absolutely astounding things. You know, nine times out of ten, it's, it's the brain holding back the body, not vice versa. So take care of the brain and, and everything else just kind of follows from there. 
Right. So we're almost out of time here. So I'll, I'll leave you with one last question, which is, um, what is, what is your all time favorite race venue or location that you've been able to uh, compete at? Ooh, um, I would say I would say Cayuga Lake Triathlon. I I, and, uh, I figured you were going to say that because <laughs> I love that one too, and and you've had a lot of success yeah. there. So <laughs> I was I was setting yeah. you up for that one. Ah, <laughs> uh, uh, you played me. <laughs> I mean, it's spectacular. You, you know, great bike course on eighty nine, rolling but still pretty, kind of fast but not too fast, rolling and interesting along the vineyards. You're swimming in Cayuga Lake. And then the run, like, are you kidding me? Running into Gannick Falls with the turn, like all grass and hard packed dirt, and then the turnaround at the waterfall, like, are you kidding me? It's amazing. Yeah, you it's, know? it's beautiful. Um, yeah, yeah. And then the awards, like, you get some, <laughs> you get like some nice nut butters, maybe a Wegman's gift certificate, you know, stuff like that. I, it's such a great race. I love it. Yeah, so do it's, I. It's my favorite. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I, it's my favorite as well, and it's probably one of the most beautiful out there. Um, and funny, uh, I'll leave you with this, but uh, someone the other day sent me a photo from, I think it was Triathlete Magazine, where they had a Cayuga Lake advertisement, and I was on it right in front of Cayu- uh, oh. the, uh, right in front of Tenantic, uh Falls. So um, so now <laughs> they, they put me in their advertisement, and so I, therefore I have to plug them. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Congrats. That's pretty fun. You put that on the wall. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Doug, you know, thanks so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. And thanks for, you know, kind of sharing a little bit about your coaching philosophy and, and your pro career. I, th- I think it's been really uh, helpful and, and insightful. So thanks a lot. Oh, yeah, no problem. Like, yeah. Thanks for listening to the Intelligent Racer Podcast. For more information on this and other episodes, please visit www.intelligentracer.com. Also, be sure to check us out on social media and please review us on your podcast directory. Join us next time for another edition of the Intelligent Racer.